I'm privileged and honored to uh, be able to talk to you today about our work uh, occurring over, well, 30 years. Um, I'm going to break my talk into three small parts. Um, first, I'm going to tell you very briefly, uh, in about two slides, 30 years of work explaining why axons don't regenerate uh, in this part of work, a little more complicated than we originally thought. Uh, and then I want to talk about more translational kind of stuff. It's more important for this crowd in particular, uh, and I have a surprise at the end. <coughs> so, actually, we're, we're surprised. So, so this is work from the hall, the godfather of, of uh, spinal cord injury and regeneration. And the hall put a knife in the in the back of a cat, and he described what happens to the the, the nerve fibers um, using his silver staining techniques. And there are really two important things, or three important things that happen. First. There's what's called a dieback phenomenon. The axons retract from the area of injury. Uh, I'll tell you just very briefly, that's due to inflammatory cells uh, that, that, that come into the injury site. You can see Cajal's uh, depiction of dieback A, B, and C has these little dotted lines. And Cajal believed that the, the axon that's cut in the white matter of the spinal cord vanishes after time. It does no longer exists, and you get dieback to a collateral uh, that's innervating the gray matter somewhere behind the lesion. But we now know, uh, due to modern staining techniques, uh, that the axons actually don't disappear from the white matter. Indeed, they persist in the white matter for the rest of your life. So they, these cut tips uh, become what's called dystrophic. These little endings have funny little shapes. The hall drew them. And, and now that we know that axons persist, the question is, what, what do these funny endings do? Uh, to maintain the axon for such a long time. That's very good news. So the neurons do not die, and the axons persist indefinitely. So they're there, waiting to be reawakened. How do we do that? Another thing that uh, doesn't happen is, of course, these axons don't regenerate. Uh, they stay put, but they don't move forward, albeit for a few that can sprout, albeit that very small, and usually not very functional, and very, very slow. Uh, I'm going to tell you today, we think that family of molecules called the proteoglycans play a role in both of these phenomena. So here's what the proteoglycans look like. They kind of look like these bottle brushes up here. There's a protein in the middle to which are attached, attached these long chain disaccharide triggers called glycosaminoglycans. You've all heard about them if you're taking glucosamine or chondroitin or shark cartilage for your joints. Those are proteoglycans. Uh, they were not thought to be present in the central nervous system until our early work showed that they're present in regions in the embryo where axons don't grow normally. So they're present here in the roof plate of the spinal cord where axons don't grow, and they're present here in orange in the periphery of the retina near your pupil where nerve fibers in the eye don't grow. So they're in barrier models, areas where there are barriers. So there are a lot of different types of proteoglycans. I'll talk just briefly about this one called NG2. Um, that's thought to be the most major of all the inhibitory proteoglycans in the central nervous system. And where, where do they appear in the central nervous system? Well, here in the lower right, they appear after injury. You can see that blue stain. So that's a stab wound in the spinal cord, just the way the hall did it. You can see the blue stain, that's the proteoglycan, right in the lesion site itself. But they're also present in the so called perineuronal net, a matrix around many kinds of synapses in the central nervous system, spinal cord concluded, and they appear after critical periods of development where we're learning how to talk and walk and see, uh, and they're thought to be a kind of a glue. It glues the connections together and keeps them uh, immutable. So that prevents the loss of what we learn, 
but it also prevents sprouting of, of nerve fibers from one place to another. So they're in the scar and they're in the net. Now, here's our, my one picture to explain why axons don't regenerate and also persist for such a long time. This is 30 years of work in this one little cartoon. So what happens after injury uh, is that you, you set up an inflammatory core in the center of the lesion by these little pink and these little pink cells. The green cells are macrophages, and they serve to drive the nerve fibers backwards. We're caught in what's called the dieback process. As the nerve fibers die back, they encounter these pink cells, which turn out to be your own stem cells. These are oligodendrocyte progenitor cells, and they make a concoction of molecules, some growth promoting, but also the NG2 protein glycan. And we now know that that concoction on those cells traps these dystrophic endings for the rest of your life. And it turns out that these endings actually make synapses upon these strange stem cells. They're happy. They're like couch potatoes. They've got no place else to go because they're beaten up by the macrophages. And they sit here on these stem cells with the synapse for the rest of your life. But that's a meaningless synapse. Now, there's a second compartment. That's the blue cells. These are the astrocytic star cells that surround the entire lesion cell. So you have two compartments. A central core where two cells are interacting. One that traps the cells, one that beats the cells backwards. That is the axons. And a star around the outside. Now, how do we get axons to move? within this tissue. There is an enzyme, we've heard a lot about it from Tony, so I don't have to go into any more detail, but chondroitinase enzyme is made by bacteria that have learned to eat through our defenses. It's called Proteus vulgaris, but the worst bacteria on Earth is they figured out what the barrier molecules are in our body, so they make chondroitinase. That clips off the sugar chains, and it's the sugar chains that, that stimulate a receptor on the, on, on the axon that sticks them in place. So when we give the chondroitinase, the nerve fibers can move within the core of the lesion relatively easily. But then when they get to the other side, they run into the scar, and that stops it. It is very difficult, almost impossible, to get axons out of a lesion. So we decided to bypass the whole damn thing. And we go back to Kahal again. Paul was testing his neurotrophic hypothesis and the role of Schwann cells as growth promoting cells. The student named Tello, and in the 1800s, they inserted a peripheral nerve graft of a rat into the cortex of the same animal. And they showed that nerve fibers in the cortex, central nervous system neurons, can grow out of the central nervous system into the graft, right? proving the Hall's neurotrophic hypothesis. But back then, people didn't know really that. They thought it might have been sensory nerve fibers from meninges going in this direction. So we didn't have directionality with this silver standard. Eighty years passed, and this famous paper by Albert Aguayo and Sam David came out in science. And I was in the audience, I remember as a student, listening to this talk, where they took a very long peripheral nerve break and held it into the brain stem here in the rack ran a long distance, many, many centimeters, down to the spinal cord. Okay, so they just made a much longer bridge. And around 1981 came a labeling technique that we could put into the graft and retrograde backwards, fill the cell bodies that produced axons in the graft. And it turns out, you can see the black dots, they were clearly central nervous system neurons producing axons in the graft over very long distances, much longer than they would have grown in the embryo. And you can see on the right side, little black dots in the brain stem and in the spinal cord. And you can see the axons in white over here. They could go long distances, but the bad news in 1981 is that the nerve fibers could not get out. They, they, they would come to the end of the graph. Many would turn around, and a few would come out, but not very many. Kind of like Hotel California, right? You can check in, but you can't check out. And so we thought, Maybe what's going on is that when you insert this graft, you create damage, and that creates a small scar, a kind of a cool de sac around the end of the bridge. Okay, so we thought, all right, we'll add chondroitinase to this old classic model. Now, why is the peripheral nerve graft good in the first place? 
for a number of reasons. One, contain Schwann cells that are providing trophic support for the survival of the axons themselves. Two, they make myelin. They can remyelinate the axons for a long distance over which they regenerate. Three, we can control the position where the graph goes. We can put it in where we want it and put it someplace else where we want it, a little bit distal. And importantly, if there is return of function, after this procedure, we can recut the graft and show that regeneration is critical for the function of recovery because we can cut the graft but spare the spinal cord and not touch it. So down here in the lower left was our initial attempts at making a lesion in the spinal cord and then just moving up the graft right above and below the lesion. I'll tell you where we target in a second. But we would put a little bit of injection of next to the top and one shot at the bottom. Right? And once you do that, Pretty black hands turn over so slowly that once you get rid of them, right, they tend to stay away for a very long period of time. Okay. We had some success initially in about 2006, collaboration with John Hulet, and he showed with my lab that we could bring about some return of function of extensors of the paw in rats, right, after hemisection lesion, right? We could, so we could fix extensors of the wrist so they could walk better. We couldn't fix the digits, we couldn't groom, right? So we thought we could fix one muscle, right? And one of the reasons for that is because when the axons get out of the graft, right, they stay put in the spinal cord at that place. They don't go very far. They get taken up by dendrites in that area where they emerge. They stay in that segment, so they don't just travel everywhere. So we fixed one muscle. I thought, all right, if we can fix one muscle fairly well, let's target a muscle that's really important. So what muscle would that be? I thought, the diet. All right? And so I brought Warren Allen, who's a respiratory expert, right, from Wayne State to my laboratory. He do introduce me to the respiratory system. And let me just describe to you a little bit about it. The respiratory system, of course, has two major motor neuron pools, one on one side and one on the other, called the phrenic motor neurons. They run from about C3 to about cervical level 6 in all species. And they get innervated from above. Right? The two important places, the blue, the blue neurons and the green ones. Right? The green ones, rostral ventral respiratory group, bring down the basic breathing rhythm to both sides, fires are crossed and uncrossed, and they tell their phrenic neurons when to fire. And these blue neurons, the serotonergic neurons, bring down serotonin, which allows regulation of breathing, especially under stress. If you're stressed out, yeah, not breathing so good in Denver, you know, and or, or you know, you got a test tomorrow and you know, you're anxious, so you've got the serotonergic system. And the two systems work together. And when you cut, uh, also, I want to point out these little green and blue collaterals down here. Uh, they're there as well. Now, how do we know that they're there? They don't work very well. If you make a spinal cord lesion here above the phrenic motor neuron on one side, we paralyze the heavy diaphragm on that side. That model allows this side to work a little bit better to make up for the air that's not going in because of this defect. So the animal can survive a high cervical lesion. We can't remain with transected C2 all the way across if the animal dies and it's beyond respiratory. So our model is to paralyze the diaphragm on one side. Now, how do we know that these fibers work? Now, if you're a baby, and you get this lesion, a baby rat or a baby human, you can still breathe. For some reason, nature, and you can breathe because of these little collaterals, nature inhibits them over time. As we get older, right, they don't work. So the animal is paralyzed here for life. Unless you now lesion the opposite phrenic nerve, which Porter did in 1895. Now why he did this, I don't know. But when you, when you do this lesion, and this lady, of course, an animal should die because it doesn't innervate the diaphragm. But that strong anoxic signal that the animal is dying because it can't breathe stimulates the blue neurons to release serotonin. Now the green ones work better. And this side begins to work within seconds. I've seen it. It's remarkable. So these fibers are present, but latent and small in number. We can drive them. So why don't these fibers re regenerate and or sprout normally? What Warren found was that when you make a lesion here, that net, the peridromal net, 30 black ends, increase. It goes from almost nothing, pre-lesion, to this green mess. That means nature puts more net 
around the neurons that you want sprouting to go to for some bizarre reason, all right? Actually actively inhibiting sprouting. All right, now I'll tell you why we think that occurs probably in one of my breakout sessions. But we thought that we could just add the enzyme here, all right? And maybe promote sprouting. If the net is so big, we'll get rid of it. So Warren did that experiment. Interestingly, you get some breathing activity back within one week, but it's very small. Only maybe 10% normal. So we thought, all right, that's not so great. We were a little bit disappointed because chondroitinase was supposed to be so terrific all by itself. You know, it can be, but it wasn't fantastic in this model. So we thought we'd go to the full model. We will make a lesion here at C2, and we'll put a bridge above the lesion, all the way down to the phrenic motor pool, where we want those motor neurons to be innervated. Here's the graft. You can see it on the left at day seven. Here's the good side, here's the graft. It's a bigger nerve now than the one we used previously. All right? We just, right above, one suture, one shot of the dry days. We let the axons grow for one week. Then we attached the distal end of the graft, another shot of the dry days, right? And we let the time pass. All right? You can see that lesion here, and the graft is bypassing the lesion C2 to C4. It's all it's, it's relatively simple. It's not so difficult. There are a few tricks. Now this is the anatomy from both 2006 and our, our, our nature paper in 2011. And you can see here, there's the graft, right? And just look here, here's the graft, spinal cord interface. Here in the middle upper, graft, spinal cord interface. Our job, now that we've got the axons all the way to here, is to get from this interface to that, to that, in there. It's less than one half of a millimeter to the interneuronal inter -neuron pool as well as the motor neurons in blue. And you can see some of the axons clearly do get out. All right? A percentage do. Typically, there are about 3,000 axons in the graph. We get out about three to 400. And that's all. Where are these nerve fibers that come, right, out of the graft into the spinal cord come from? Interesting. When we backfill, you can see this these little map of the brain stem. Uh, where are those respiratory neurons right, in the brain stem live? All right? Do we get axons from them? And indeed, we do. So right here is the so-called Rosso. There it is. There's the RVRG. There are some neurons. There they are labeled. They can regenerate. The respiratory rhythm neurons can grow. And that's how many there are. Of the total that are filled, it's about 10 percent. 90 percent of the neurons that send axons into the graft have little or nothing to do with breathing. Now, there's the problem. You've got nine out of ten neurons that have nothing to do with breathing innervating the phrenic motor neuron pool. Is this a good thing, or is this going to be really, really bad? It's why people think that regeneration doesn't occur in the first place, because what you get after regeneration would be far worse. Uh, than being paralyzed. So nature covers it up. So, does this work? And we were amazed uh, that it does. And uh, I wanted to show, these are EMG right here in the, in the right middle, of normal breathing in a normal rat. Uh, this, this is EMG and an analysis. Okay, so you can see normal breathing here. How much time do I have left? 12 minutes. Okay, good time. Okay, so we have EMG analysis here of normal breathing. You can see the pattern of breathing. And these little bumps in between is the heart. Okay, that's right underneath the light. That's normal breathing. Here's a grafted animal, chondroitinase. At three weeks after the treatment, this is normal breathing, but nothing. No return to function in three weeks. We looked at six weeks. Now we're talking a month and a half, all right? Almost nothing. Eight weeks, nothing. In 2006, we had seen some return of function in six weeks. Eight weeks have passed. Warren quit. We gave up. He said, all these animals in two months, nothing's coming back. He put the animals away to just test electrodes for another experiment. We were very impressed. And he tested electrodes in an animal at 10 weeks. And he said, he runs, I knew he ran into my office. He said, Jerry, I see activity in the diaphragm. He said, okay, let's go longer. Between 10 and 12 weeks, activity blooms in the diaphragm. 
All right, and you can see that down here. Now, interestingly, as the respiratory rhythm starts to come back, albeit small, at six and nine weeks, there's always pattern activity. Although you see skip breaths, like here, where the arrow's on. And sometimes the breaths are very deep or very shallow. So like the spinal cord is trying to figure things out. Right? But then, remarkably, the pattern just sorts itself out and sounds and looks like this. So this is normal breathing.
you get this problem, where now the bladder squeezes, the sphincter stays closed, and we're very tight. So we have to catheterize it. And that whole problem is all kinds of problems. My colleagues are Yushan Lee and Mark DePaul, a student between, between our two labs. Uh, does this work? So we decided to move towards a complete transaction model uh, in, in the spinal cord, right? And hopefully bridge from here at T8 all the way down to the pattern generator for micturition down here in the, in the lower lumbar and upper sacral cord. Now, you could not do that. And the reason is the cord is too small. At that point, you know, we have to put it in our bridge just to do way too much damage. Maybe we tried for six months. Failed. So we thought, all right, we're not going to give up. We, we, will, we will try to bridge the lesion here at the thoracic area inside the lesion rather than bypassing. And we use this technique, right? Full transection of five millimeter gap at T8, complete gap. We would fill that with 12 to 14 adroit A treated nerve segments from the same end, taken from the intercostal space. We would then put chondroid gaze at both ends. Right, so chase soaked grafts and chase at both ends. So fill the whole thing up. And then we see what happens. The pons is up here, way left. Hand some of those axons across the bridge. You get all the way down to here. And then an amazing journey for them. All right, and I'm going to tell you, amazingly, they can. Go figure. Uh, I don't know if you can see this. This just shows the anatomy. This is the rostral part of the cord, here's the caudal part of the cord, and here's the gap. You see the nerve fibers entering the gap, and right, exiting the graft here, and down here at E, and way down here at F, you can see nerve fibers. Right, they can, they can go. This is at six months. It takes a long, long time. Here's another picture. Axons exiting from the graft, exiting into the graft, right? here in the graph, and then exiting into the spinal cord, going long distances, probably. We f Here's another picture, down here, lower left, they make synapses. So they make connections, that's a synapse marker. See the green dots? Well, I can see them. And, can those neurons in the brainstem that are involved in maturation, it's called the Pontine Maturation Center, send axons all the way down the cord, so we backfill them. And indeed, here's Barrington's nucleus, that controls the sphincter. Here's a so-called D region that controls the bladder. Several of those cells are filled. They can go all the way down, which is, I think, remarkable. And many other neurons in other places are also with nothing in the cortex. Something about these brainstem, particular formation neurons, these primitive neurons, endows them with the ability to grow when we give them some help. Now, here's when I enjoy some physiology. Does this work? And the animal is P. And you can see here a normal animal with a catheter, so the females, right into the bladder, filling with saline through a pump. And you can see the normal maturation cycle. This is pressure on the up, upper part. This is the pressure in the bladder. And here's each cycle. So they pee about, you know, every five minutes. Right? And it just works, sir. That's the type of animals. All right? And I want you to hear this. So this is what normal peeing sounds. Like in a rat. This is one cycle. So this, this is from the sphincter. You're hearing the sphincter doing its thing.
Okay, now does this combination technique work? Look up here, this is one cycle in a normal animal. Here's pressure uh, over here, and this is sphincter activity. You can see at the time the animal pees, you can see these, these pulse, the pulses. That's normal urination in a rat. All the structure of the animal is transected, nothing that looks like normal. The graft only, nothing that looks like normal. Here's the chase plus the FGF, which is another thing we're adding to this cocktail. It helps the graft integrate better. Not so great. Graft plus FGF may be a little bit better, but look at here, in the lower right, the full Monty I call it, we start to get back to the normal pattern of, the, of peeing. It's not perfect. And when we retransect, right, this recovery vanishes, proving that regeneration is critical. Now, does this, this work? to help the animals actually pee. That's physiology. So we put our animals in these activity chambers. They have free access to food and water, and they pee. And this, this device separates fecal material from urine, and the computer measures how much comes out and how often. So this is normal peeing in a, in a sham animal. The blue line is in three months after the sham. Six months is in red. They pee a lot, and they pee a little bit. They pee all the time, 30 times, approximately, in 16 hours. This is transection, and you can see here the problem. So they can pee, sort of, but a lot of volume, and very irregularly. In six months, they pee only maybe four times, in the same time that a normal animal does 30. If you can see all, all the subcombinations, right, does not help. When we get to the full Monty over here, in blue, you can start to see return of function, and then in six months, right, animals are getting that closer to a normal pattern of urination. It's quantified here. So this is volume, <coughs> should be very low. There's transected animals in all the groups, it's high. It's starting to get lower at three months, but not significant. But at six months, see the white line, white bar, the black bar is going down, much better. This is volume, should be high, the white bar. At three months, a little bit of a trend, but not significant. But six months, much better, all right? It's continuing to improve a bit with one more, just one more slide. So we have also uh, restored some of the bladder pathology. Now, here's the question for all of you. What about chronic injury? And here's the surprise. Uh, we wanted to look at chronic injury, but not just one month. We thought, let's go one full year uh, in a rat, which is fairly impressive. We went back to our respiratory model to ask, what happens to these collaterals after a whole year? Are they still there? Can they function? What are they doing? Are they creating all kinds of bad connections? But we didn't know. So we decided to put one injection of chondroitin base into the phrenic border pool and see what happens. After one full year after injury. This is an animal with paralysis of the diaphragm after one year. There's nothing in the diaphragm. One full year. After the enzyme injection, I am happy to tell you that within one week, we start to see activity come back in the diaphragm, just in one week, after one full year, which is much better than in acute stages when we just had the enzyme. This is about 50% total peak amplitude, right, of the normal side. Whereas in acute stages, it's only 10%. Now, I can discuss this, why is this happening, right, in our breakout sessions, but we think we have this figured out. So we'll talk about that later, but it's very, very good news. So I want to end with these two quotes from Gaul. Hall said it is doubtful whether there exists a negative neurotropism. He didn't believe in molecules like proteoglycan. I hope you agree he's wrong on that. He also said, once development is complete, the sources of growth and regeneration of axons and dendrites are irretrievably lost. In the adult brain, the nerve paths are fixed, immutable, everything can die. Nothing can be regenerated. I hope I have convinced you that that's dead wrong. And there's a tremendous capacity for regeneration and was crowded, very, very chronic, and also acute stages. Thank you. Visit u2fp.org for more coverage from Working to Walk and the latest in spinal cord injury news.